In these verses in Hebrews chapter 12, God the Holy Spirit, by the writer of this book, who I believe was Paul, but that's no, no matter, a lot of people don't, but it's written by God, is giving both encouragement to endure, to persevere in the faith, under the burden of trials, uh, the things that we go through, Brother Mark prayed, all the difficulties that <clears throat> we go through in life. Some of them are the troubles that all people suffer alike. I mean, just like this pandemic, uh, it, it, it's, not, it's not just true believers who get COVID. It's unbelievers too and vice versa. As true believers, we're to look at them in a different way because of God's word. It's what he tells us, not how we feel. Uh, he calls them the chastisements. Anything we suffer in this life as a child of God, I think comes under the heading of, because God is in control and it's God's will, comes under the heading of the loving chastisements of our Heavenly Father. But there are other specific sufferings that are not common to all people. And that's what the Bible calls suffering for righteousness sake or suffering for the gospel. When we stand with our Lord and with one another, when we in our fellowship and speak the same thing, then we suffer for the gospel. We suffer for righteousness sake. The persecutions that come from the world because of the hatred of the gospel. The Bible clearly says in John chapter 3 that light has come into the world and that light is Christ. That light is his truth, his gospel light. And also in other portions of scripture, the church, the true church of the living God where the which is the pillar and ground of truth, is called a light. Your lights in this world shine forth as lights. But John 3.19 tells us that men hate the light. And I understand why, because I was there. I was there with them before God opened my eyes, gave me eyes to see, you must be born again or you cannot see the kingdom of God. I know when I first heard the gospel, I did not like what I was hearing at all. Did not believe it, did not want it. Wouldn't have gone back to hear it again except for God's providence and power. And so we stand together speaking the same thing. Men hate the light because their deeds are evil. What are we telling unbelieving people? We're telling them that everything they hold dear <clears throat> everything they applaud, everything they have hope in, everything they take refuge in is a lie. That's what we're telling them. You say, well, how can you be so judgmental? We're just speaking the word of God. Christ told his disciples in John chapter 15, he said, marvel not if the world hates you. Why, Lord? Why? Because it hated me before it hated you. The disciple is no better, not above his master. If they hated the one we follow, the one we trust in, the one whom we take refuge in, they'll hate us. You understand that? Now, it's not that we go around wanting people to hate us. I mean, I'm, I'm not going, I don't go on television or stand here in this pulpit just so I can get people to dislike me or hate me. I want everybody to like me. But there's one thing by the grace of God I won't do. And I say by the grace of God because apart from his grace, I would do it. I will not compromise the truth and speak peace to them in order to get them to like me. Now I said all that to say this. We've been talking about the children of God going through the chastisements of the loving father. He compared it to our fathers on earth who disciplined their children out of love when they saw fit. He says in verse 10, look at it, Hebrews 12. He says, for they verily for a few days chastened us. 
That is, they corrected us. May, may have been some punishment there, may have been some lectures, whatever. But they chastened us after their own pleasure. That, that doesn't mean they took pleasure in doing it. It means they, they thought it, they knew it was needed. But he for our profit, and here's the key, here's where I want to go to today. That we might be partakers of his holiness. God the Father, why does he chasten us? Why does he correct us? Why does he by his grace keep us in endurance, perseverance? That we might be partakers of his holiness. It's always for his glory. It's always for our eternal good. That we might be partakers of his holiness. What's that about? That word partakers, it's a word of fellowship. That's what it means. It means to be a participant. It's translated fellowship over in 1 John chapter 1. We, our fellowship is with the Father and the Son. We have fellowship with one another. Read in the opening passages here in 2 Peter chapter 1 where he said that by the promises of God that is as the Holy Spirit reveals the promises of God to us the gospel promises of salvation forgiveness of sin justification before God based upon his righteousness imputed as those promises are revealed to us in the gospel as fulfilled and sure and certain in the person and work of Christ that's how we are made partakers of the divine nature. And that's how we escape the corruption that is in the world through lust. Partakers of the divine nature. I hear men today talk about, well, that means we have a new divine nature within us. That's not what that means at all. When God the Holy Spirit in the new birth gives us life, we have life from God. It's divine life because it originated but it's not in its nature divine. I heard an old preacher say one time that we have, the, have God's DNA in us. God doesn't have DNA. He created DNA. I heard a man say that means we have a new divine nature created in us. My friend, if it's divine, I'm going to tell you one thing about it. It's not created. If it's divine by nature, it has no beginning and no end. That's what divinity is. There's the nature of God. There's the nature of man. There's the nature of, of angels. There's the nature of animals. But only God has a divine nature. And that's what his holiness is. So what he's saying here in 2 Peter 1.4 is that by these promises revealed to us by the Holy Spirit that brings us to Christ, we are brought into fellowship. With the divine nature. With God. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Fellowship. That's what partakers means. And then, what is God's holiness? We sang that song, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Normally, when we think of holiness, we think about moral perfection. No sin. Well, that certainly would describe God, wouldn't it? He has no sin. Even the Lord Jesus Christ, both in his deity and his humanity, he is the impeccable son of God, the, the impeccable savior. He had no sin, knew no sin. He was never corrupted by sin. Oh, he was made sin. How? By a legal act of divine imputation, God charged him with the debt of the sins of his people. And he was made guilty in that sense. In other words, he was liable to the punishment of God's wrath as our surety, as our substitute, as our redeemer. But he was not, he was sinless and remains so, still is. Even in his humanity. We're not. We're not sinless. We're sinners. You're either a sinner lost in your sin or a sinner saved by grace. If you're a sinner saved by grace, you're in a struggle with sin. It's a battle. Every day, every hour, every minute, every second. That's what it is. 
So when we think of God's holiness, what do we think of? Well, God's holiness, think about it this way. It's his separateness. What separates God? Do you know, let me tell you something. There's no person, there is no object, there is no thing like our God. He is in a class by himself. That's what holiness means. He's unique. That's holiness. He's distinct. What will you compare God to? Listen to this. Let me read these to you. Exodus 15, 11. Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? You know what the point of that rhetorical question is? There's nothing like God. No one like God. Listen to this, Psalm 71, 19. Thy righteousness also, O God, is very high. Who has done great things? O God, who is like unto thee? One of my favorite verses is in Isaiah chapter 45. And the reason this is one of my favorites is because I believe this is where the Lord really got my attention. I don't know the day that I was converted. I don't know that day. And you know what? I don't care. I just know that I was converted at some point in time that God appointed. I don't have to point to a day. You know, these people going and talking about this is my spiritual birthday. I don't, I don't know what my spiritual birthday is. But I know at some point in time, God got my attention. And he did it with this verse. Isaiah 45 and verse 21. Tell ye and bring them near, yea, let them take counsel together. Who hath declared this from ancient time? Who hath told it from that time? Have not I the Lord? And there is no God beside me. And you know how he identifies his uniqueness here? A just God and a Savior. What? A just God? What, what does a just God do? He acts in justice, strict, unmixed, pure justice. Is that wrong? Is that mean? Is that cruel? No, it's God. That's who he is. But then how can he be a savior too? When I heard that phrase, I thought, man, I've never heard anything like that. I need to look into that more. A just God and a Savior. There's none beside me. There's nobody on the equal plane with God. That's what he said. That's holiness right there. A just God and a Savior. And he says, look unto me and be ye saved all the ends of the earth. For I'm God, there is none else. Well, the answer to the question, how can God be both a just God and a Savior, is found in the gospel, isn't it? And you know that gospel is a holy gospel. There's nothing else like it. It's unique. And it gives us the answer. God sent forth his son in the fullness of the time, made of a woman, made under the law to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because you are sons, he sent forth his spirit. The answer to the question is simply the imputed righteousness of Christ, the son of God, God man. The righteousness of God. That's how God can be both just and still save a sinner like me. Isn't that simple? But people want to complicate it, don't they? And let me tell you something. Go, uh, don't do this, but I, you know, go study all the religions of the world, all the denominations, and you'll never find the answer to that question except in the true gospel. And that sets God apart from every other supposed called, so-called God. Nothing like him. By his power and grace, God has separated a people unto himself. And he's broken. You see, by nature, we're in fellowship with the world. 
having fallen in Adam, being ruined by the fall, being born and dead in trespasses and sin, coming forth from the womb speaking lies, sinners, alien, by nature alienated from God, by nature no different than the children of wrath. At that time we were in fellowship with the world. But God, who is rich in mercy and grace, what did he do? By those precious promises, Peter wrote, he has made us partakers of the divine nature. Here in Hebrews 12, he speaks of the chastisements and the suffering that declares us to be partakers of his holiness. The holy God has brought unto himself through Christ a holy people. Does that mean we're morally pure without any taint or contamination of sin? No. But it means this. It means he has broken our fellowship with the world and brought us into fellowship with him through Christ. By his grace. Listen to this. 1 Peter 2, 9, you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a separate nation, a peculiar people, that means purchased, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. The world's in darkness. We're in light. We know the truth. And it's not because we're better than other people. It's not because we're smarter than other people. It's because God, out of his sovereign will, chose us and gave us to Christ. Verse 11, look at this. He says, now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous. If you're going through trials, that's not a happy, happy time for, for us to... It doesn't feel good. He says it's grievous, burdensome. It's hard. Nevertheless, he says, afterward. Now, you know what the afterward is? It's when God finally brings us through. That wave that came in has gone out, but now another one's coming. Afterward, it yieldeth what? The peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Those who experience these things. What is that peaceable fruit of righteousness? Well, you've got to ask yourself this question. What is righteousness? In the Bible, righteousness is perfect satisfaction to God's law and justice. It's a perfection. In the Bible now, it's a perfection required by the law of God. That can only be found in the person and work of Christ. And he says, he's talking about here, not that we applaud ourselves when we come through and look in the mirror and pat ourselves on the back and say, look how, how good we did. No. Let me ask you a question. When you go through a hard trial, I mean a hard one. Some of y'all been through some hard trials, haven't you? Going through that trial, did you sin? Don't answer, except in your mind. You bet you did, and I did too. Going through that trial, weren't there times that you were ashamed of yourself? Had thoughts that were just dishonoring to God? Had thoughts of pride. Lord, why me? I don't deserve this. Well, let's talk about what we deserve. Huh? Is that the righteousness that he's talking about? Well, if it is, boy, he's come off his standard quite a bit now. You know as well as I do that the only one who ever suffered what I believe is the hardest trial a human being can go through and never sinned was the Lord Jesus Christ. He never sinned. I can't say that. So what is this peaceable fruit of righteousness? It has to do 
Whenever we go through these trials and become keenly reminded of our sinfulness and our weaknesses, that we come out knowing even more. We've learned even more. The truth that we knew before, that God is our strength, Christ is our victory, and when we go through trials, we often learn that lesson that we have to learn over and over and over again. If not for God's grace and power, we would be damned forever. And so that peaceable fruit of righteousness is the strengthening of our faith in Christ and the assurance that we have in Him as expressed in Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good, that to them that love God who are the called according to his purpose. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's... Boy, aren't you glad God doesn't impute sin to us? That he imputes his righteousness. Who can condemn us? It's Christ that died. It's coming out of the end, other end of that trial. Looking to, resting in, more and more, Christ and his righteousness. Over in Isaiah 32, let me just read this to you. It speaks of verse 16 of Isaiah 32. Then judgment shall dwell in the wilderness and righteousness remain in the fruitful field. It's talking about the coming of Christ in there. And verse 17 of Isaiah 32. If you haven't got this underlined in your Bible, you ought to underline it. It says, and the work of righteousness shall be peace. And the effect of righteousness, quietness, and assurance forever. Verse 18 says, And my people shall dwell in a peaceable habitation and in sure dwellings and in quiet resting places. How is that possible in this world? Only as we look to Jesus Christ as the author and finisher of our faith. Only as we look to him for righteousness. And then look back at Hebrews 12. In verse 12 he says, for this reason, wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down in the feeble knees. What he's talking about is these trials that we go through, even the hard trials, they're not going to put us down forever. Stand up and rejoice in the Lord. Verse 13, make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. How is that possible? Not but one way. Looking to Christ, resting in Christ, pleading his blood, his righteousness. Oh, my soul, by the grace of God, I am what I am. Washed in his blood, clothed in his righteousness. And so, verse 14 says, follow peace with all and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. The reason this is put in there is because much of the chastisements of the Lord, especially those that come over our witness of the gospel, come from the world. They come from unbelieving people. We were talking about it before earlier, how, how it's possible that, that those who are ensconced in false Christianity, which we call idolatry, don't we? Are we in fellowship there? See what I'm saying? That's our holiness, see? It's our separateness, just like God is separate. We're separated in him. Se Paul called it separated unto the gospel of God. The light that people hate. How they could persecute us if the law would allow it. May do it someday. And so what does he say? He encourages, well, we're to be peaceful people. Now we have peace with God through the blood of Christ. That's what sets us apart. We, ha we have and are to strive for peace with one another in the truth, the gospel of peace. So what is the significance of peace with all men, and this includes unbelievers? Well, as I said, many of these persecute, you know, he said, marvel not if the world hates you. Blessed are you when men shall persecute you and say all manner of evil against you for righteousness sake. What he's saying here is that we're to be peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers. Now we're not to lie to them in order to gain peace. We're not to speak a lie to them. We're not to speak peace to them in order to maintain peace. But we're not to be the ones who provoke persecution by our bad behavior, or our bad attitudes. 
We're to strive for peace with everyone. But is that peace at all cost? No. And holiness. In other words, we're not to compromise that which separates us from the world in order to maintain peace with. Think about our Savior. The ones who persecuted him most in his earthly walk were who? The religious majority, the Pharisees. Now, you know what he could have done if, if he wouldn't have done this, but let's say if to have peace with those guys, what, what could he have done? He could have just come down and he said, man, you Pharisees, you've really, you've really held the ball. You've really kept it together. You've really taught my people right. Man, I tell you what, when we, when we go to glory, you're going to be on my right hand and my left hand. You could, that would have gotten peace. Oh, Caiaphas up there, look at him. Follow his word. But what did he do? He said, except your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no wise enter the kingdom of heaven. Then what happened? That nature of a snake come out of him. He said, you hypocrites. Was he trying to start a fight? <laughs> no, he was just telling the truth. They were on the road to destruction and they were leading multitudes on that same road. Look at Galatians chapter 6, verse 14. Think about the Apostle Paul. Now before he was converted, he was a Pharisee. He was a leader. And he had a lot of reasons to tell people that evidence that he knew God, that he was in fellowship with God, he was saved. He said, I was a Hebrew of Hebrews. I was circumcised the eighth day. I was, uh, it's touching the law of Pharisee. It's touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. All those things. And he had a lot of fellowship with other people in that testimony, didn't he? The Pharisees. But what happened? Christ struck him down on the road to Damascus and brought him to the gospel. And then everything changed. His fellowship went from the world to fellowship with God. And what he called righteous and holy at one point, now he said it's worthless, it's dung. And look at what he says in Galatians 6.14. This is his separateness now. This is our separateness. This is the holiness that we're to follow. But God forbid... That I should glory, boast, have confidence, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the person and work of Christ. The glorious person and finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ is my boast, is my refuge, my glory, my confidence. By whom the world is crucified unto me. I look at the world as being cursed. That's what he means by that. Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. And the world looks upon me as being cursed. I unto the world. Look at verse 15. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creature, a new creation. You remember when Paul said, I know I'm a child of God because I was circumcised the eighth day? Well, something changed. He was brought to faith in Christ and repentance of dead works. Now he says, circumcision doesn't mean a thing. Whether you're a Jew or a Gentile doesn't mean a thing. Are you a new creature in Christ? How do I know if I'm a new creature in Christ? I'm looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of my faith. Not looking anywhere else. And he says in verse 16, As many as walk according to this rule, this doctrine. What rule? God forbid that I should glory save in the cross. Peace be on them. The peace of God. What rule are you walking by? Well, I'm trying to do my best to get God to forgive me. No peace on you. 
You're at war with God, actually. I'm trying my best to be the best I can be, and hopefully God will accept me at judgment. No peace there. What rule? God forbid. You know, that's a strong phrase. God forbid. You ever seen uh, uh, on TV, on the news, or read in the paper of some heinous, perverted, ugly crime? And you might use these words. You might say, God forbid. Paul's talking about religion. God forbid that I should glory, save in the person and work of Christ. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them, mercy, and upon the Israel of God. Those who walk according to that rule, they're the Israel of God. They're in the family of God. I'm going to talk about that next week when we get into Mount Zion. That's the city of God. We are citizens of a heavenly city. That's our holiness. And so he says in verse 15, go back to Hebrews 12 and I'll close. He says, looking diligent lest any man fail or come short of the grace of God. People who sometimes claim to believe in grace, but they don't believe in grace, they fail. They're looking elsewhere other than Christ. And he says, lest any root of bitterness bringing in up trouble you and thereby many be defiled. Oh, it's, sometimes it's easy to get people to get their eyes off Christ and on some Somebody else or on themselves. But you see, the grace of God keeps his people. Verse 16, lest there be any fornicator and profane person as Esau. It compares him to Esau. What do you know about Esau? He was Jacob's twin brother. He sold his birthright, sold for, for one morsel of meat, sold, sold his birthright. That birthright had to do with the spiritual headship of the family. And what Esau was showing by doing that, he didn't care about spiritual things. He didn't care about being the spiritual leader. He didn't care about the gospel. He didn't care about the promise of the coming Messiah. He didn't care about the glory of God. He was a man of the world. An admired man of the world. But he didn't care about those spiritual things, so he sold his birthright. And it says in verse 17, For you know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. His father uh, uh, Isaac rejected him because he had already given the blessing to, to Jacob, and you know the story. For he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Esau was a man of the world who lived by the world, and when he saw that his brother connived to get something that belonged to him, he wept tears and he wanted his father to change it. His father couldn't. He wasn't seeking the repentance that comes in the gospel by the Holy Spirit. He was just upset that Jacob took away from him that which was his. He got tricked. That's what it was. Well, my friend, to be a partaker of the holiness of God. What a thought. What separates God? His nature, His glory. What separates us? The grace of God. By the grace of God, I am what I am. The truth that we preach is unique. There's nothing like this gospel. Do you not realize that? There is absolutely nothing in this world, in any philosophy or religion, like this gospel that we know and believe and preach and follow and support. Now, we want to be peaceful. I don't want trouble. I don't want wars. I don't want fights. But my friend, if it comes over the gospel, we're going to follow holiness, aren't we? By the grace of God. That's how we do it. Okay.